Be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In the gospel lesson for today, Jesus uses the word divorce. And as soon as many of us hear this word, lots and lots of feelings come springing up into our minds. And uh, they're not always very happy feelings, are they? Sometimes we will feel um, abandonment or resentment or anger or um, regret or shame. Sometimes we feel relief or even peace too. And 150 different sermons come rattling around inside of our skulls, sermons that we have heard from pastors, sermons that we have heard from members of our family, sermons that, that that were never even spoken, never articulated, never expressed with words, but come across to us by the vibe, by uh, the way that people treat each other in our communities and families and in our churches. And there is uh, a variety of messages we get about divorce. Like, for example, God's plan for you is to be part of a marriage with a wife and a husband and uh, wonderful, well-behaved, cherubic, shiny little children sitting next to you in church. Yes, yes. And if you're not part of a family like that, then you don't really belong. I mean, we'll let you in. But the real people, the important people, the exciting and shiny people are the ones who are part of a, a wife and a husband and two shining or three or four, maybe five, shiny cherubic little children sitting next to them in church. So I will speak for uh, the people with the wife and the husband and the little children, okay, because I've been married for 33 years and it's fantastic, it's wonderful, it's a, it's a beautiful um, adventure. Um, with uh, my wife, Thine, uh, it's been great, and we have three children, and they are wonderful too, and occasionally even well-behaved. <laughs> it's great. It's a wonderful way to be family. And God's plan for us is indeed to love each other in such a family. But that's not the only kind of family we can be. We can be family when we are single, we can be family when we've been divorced. We can be family when we uh, are in a same-sex marriage. We love each other. That's God's plan for us. So given the fact that all kinds of sermons and messages and feelings are rattling around in our heads, um, it is a bit of a miracle that you can hear my voice right now. Uh, over the din of different messages that are rattling around in your head. So if you can hear me and you can attach any meaning at all to what I'm saying, uh, I wish to thank you for hanging in there and uh, for trusting me, which I'm going to try to honor your trust today. So let's start with the basics. Number one, God loves you, full stop. No if, ands, or buts, no prerequisites, no tiny print on the edge of the page. God has always loved you. Sometimes God gets mad at us because we do stupid things that are not loving to each other. And when God gets mad at us, it is appropriate for us to be terrified. We should be terrified of making God mad because it hurts God. Okay? All right. But God still loves us even if God is mad at us. God loves all of us, no exceptions, all of us. That's number one. Number two, because God loves all of us, God requires 
demands that we love each other and ourselves. Okay? Are you prickling your seat a little bit yet? Um, that we do our very best to show each other, uh, treat each other with dignity and uh, with care. Let's see. Right. Number three is that we don't always do that, do we? Sometimes we blow each other to little bits for no good reason. Sometimes we overreact to somebody for dropping the plate. Sometimes we loathe ourselves even when we need desperately to be loved. Number four, even though we don't love each other or ourselves the way we should, God has mercy. God has mercy. God sent Jesus into our world, into our lives, into our soul, to the most bitter, destructive, hateful, cowardly, cruel places in ourselves and brought the love of God to us there at the cross, at the cross. That saves. Because that love is bigger than any evil. Any evil. Basics. God loves us. God requires that we love each other. Sometimes we fail. God has mercy. If you forget everything else I say today, carry that forward. Okay? Remember that bit. If you disagree with everything else I say, and I know some of you are going to disagree with me. You already do. We've talked. It's okay. Remember the four basics. All right. Um, next, uh, I want to talk a little bit about te Jesus' teaching in the gospel lesson for today. Not so much about divorce, but about marriage. Jesus says, the two shall become one flesh. Okay, that does not mean that we um, lose our identity in each other. Okay, for example, my wife, Thine, she is very good at details. And so because she is good at details, she takes care of paying the bills. Because if I was in charge of paying the bills, things would not go well. If you've ever seen my, my desk at one of the uh, uh, overwhelming majority of times when it is uh, like piled high, you know that the bills would get all stuck in the middle of the piles and, um, you know, we'd like have bill collectors at our door. So she takes care of the bills. Now, Thine hates talking on the phone with people she doesn't know. She just can't stand to call somebody up that she does not know. So if there's anybody like a handyman or a plumber that we have to call or have a question about uh, registration of our, our driver's licenses or anything, renewing registration, I'm the one that has to make the call because I make phone calls all the time, right? So that's my job. I do not, in our marriage, become better at details at least not as good as she does, and she does not, in our marriage, become the one who makes the phone calls. Our identities are not fused. We are still individuals, but we are a team. That's the point. We are a team. We are partners. We work together. And we face the challenges of life, which sometimes are very profound. We face the challenges and the joys of life, which are also profound, together. And when we do that together, then we are a part of one another. And that connection goes deep, deep, deep. The two become one flesh. That's marriage. And that can happen with all kinds of different people. Right? You can be friends and have that kind of connection. You can be um, divorced and have that kind of connection with someone else. You can have a same-sex marriage and have that same kind of connection. You can be transgender and have that same kind of connection. God's will for us is that we love each other. That's the plan. Now, what 
When we are so deeply connected, the other person is like a part of us, and we've built something beautiful together and holy. And that's why it hurts so much when we get a divorce, for most of us. If we get a divorce, it hurts deeply. It hurts. So in our gospel lesson for today, Jesus tells the men, you're not supposed to divorce somebody and then run off and get married to somebody else. And to the women also, he says, you're not supposed to divorce somebody and get married to somebody else. In our Lutheran church, we will preside over a wedding uh, for you if you are divorced. Done that for years and years. So why do we do that when Jesus says this particular passage right there in front of us? Here's what's going on for us. Number one, we interpret everything in the Bible that has to do with right and wrong according to Jesus' law that he clearly states in the Gospel of Matthew. He says, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your strength and all your mind, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Everything that has to do with right and wrong, we will interpret through that lens. And what the conclusion we have come to for a couple of reasons is that after divorce, there can be new life. God makes all things new. So we interpret that law, as well as every other law in the Bible, which you can pick and choose, whatever makes you feel comfortable. Like, guys, uh, if you have long hair, you can't have long hair. Ladies, where are your hats? Everybody is wearing linen and cotton at the same time. You need to take one of them off, all right? How do we pick and choose between that and, say, the laws against uh, same-sex uh, connections? Here's how we choose. We choose, we say, what is the most loving thing toward the God who is revealed to us in Jesus Christ and what is loving to our neighbor. That's our interpretive principle. And that's why we come to that conclusion. You may not, that's fine, because we're gonna be different and we will come to different conclusions, but that's why. Number two, number two, this section of the Gospel of Mark that we are reading right now, this week and next week, it is part of a teaching that Jesus is giving about the journey of the cross. Jesus has said that he is going to the cross. He has said that if you want to be a leader, we talked about this two weeks ago, if you want to be a leader in the church, then you have to be a servant. Okay? You serve. Well, who do you serve? These are the people you serve. People who are on the edge, on the boundaries, on the margins, who don't have a whole lot of legal, social, or financial power. That's who you serve. Okay, so in this gospel lesson for today and next week, we hear about three kinds of people that have one thing in common. Today is addressed the question about women who are being divorced. And then in the second part of the gospel lesson for today, we'll talk about children. We'll get to that in a minute. And then next week, it'll be wealth and poverty, people who are poor. Those three different kinds of people have one thing in common. They're on the edge. They don't have as much legal social, or financial power as other people in Jesus' day. So this section of the Gospel of Mark is about how we treat folks who are having a hard time. That's what it's about. Now, in Jesus' day, um, the vast majority of women had to live in a man's household under a man's authority. If you were a woman, then you would grow up in your father's house, and then you would be under your husband's authority. If your husband died, you'd go back to your father's house or maybe to your brother's house. If, uh, uh, if your husband divorced you and your um, father wasn't furious at you for disgracing the family somehow by being divorced, then you could go back to your father's house or maybe to one of your son's houses if they still liked you. Um, uh, but if you had no sons and your father was dead and your brother was a schmuck, then you had two choices. You could be a sex worker or you could beg on the streets. Divorce was not just devastating as it can be nowadays. It was deadly. 
So Jesus is saying to the men, don't be getting a divorce and running off with some hot chick you found on the internet. All right? It's wrong, and it's also deadly. He also says to the women, don't be getting a divorce and running off with some hairy hot chunk you found on the internet, because divorce hurts men too. <laughs> really does. We would submit for your consideration that that's what's going on here. And that therefore, there is a possibility of new life. This is the same way of thinking, whereby uh, some of us will do a same-sex marriage. Because Jesus speaks specifically about divorce and remarriage in this passage. And we say, we look at the, at the overall context of scripture and who, who God is as revealed in Jesus Christ, and we say, we will marry someone who is divorced. Jesus says absolutely nothing about gay and lesbian people, nothing at all. If we're gonna be willing to set a specific word of Jesus aside in order to uh, believe in God's new life and believe in God's new hope, then we, some of us, are certainly willing to, uh, to look at same-sex marriage, even though there are other prohibitions in the Bible to it, because our primary principle of understanding right and wrong is from Matthew. Jesus says, you will love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. That's where it comes from. Just so you know, we're not just wiggle-walking around, we're thinking about this stuff, okay? In the second part of the gospel lesson for today, Jesus talks about children. And he's not just loving children because they're so nice and cheery and shiny and beautiful, because children are not always that nice and cheery and shiny and beautiful, are they? No, they're not. They can be annoying and sometimes mean, just like us grown-ups. Yes. No, Jesus is, is, is concerned about the children because children had no value in Jesus' day. They had no legal, social, or financial power. And so uh, Jesus uh, is attracted to them for that reason. Jesus loves everybody, but he is particularly concerned with people who are on the edge, who have a hard time. And children did not have, certainly their parents loved them. Make no mistake of that. But outside of the family, no protections, no value. So the disciples are kind of like, oh, these children, what are they doing? They're in the way. They're not advancing our glorious quest. And Jesus gets angry with his disciples, said, no, 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 no. You let those children come to me because God is in them. And if you want to be a part of the realm of God, then check your ego at the door. Understand that our legal and social and financial power is subsidiary underneath the power of God and are used only to serve God. We who have legal power, whatever legal power we might have, or social power, or financial power, those powers are given to us by God to be used in the service of God, to the glory of God, for people who are on the edge, for uh, the celebration of life, yes. But that's not what makes us who we are, and that's not what makes us important. The dignity of God is what makes us important. So we will become like children. We understand that as human beings, we are mortal, we are tiny, we are powerless without presence of the one who loves us infinitely. Let the children come, these tiny little things. And next week, we'll talk about wealth and poverty. This section of the Gospel of Mark is about what it means to follow on the journey of the cross, what it means to serve. So we have these basics, that God loves us, God requires that we love each other, that we don't always fulfill that requirement, but that God has mercy. God has mercy. And therefore, we can get up and keep going in new life. Thanks be to God.